talking about uh, Frank would be the maestro. Oh, yeah. Good. Okay. All right. Well, um, uh, I, I want to welcome everyone to our Simsbury Public Library lecture series. Um, I'm delighted tonight to present John Straub. Very delighted. And it's interesting because I was trying to find the right words to describe John. And I thought, well, let me just go back and, Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> and, and take a look at what's been written about him in our member recognition columns. And I found this introduction by Lou Norton. Oh, Lou, it's wonderful. So Lou, I'm plagiarizing completely. So I think it's important to get it kind of the back story on John to give you a real sense of him. And what Lou wrote was, when one chooses a profession that necessitates examining images in great detail to interpret their meaning, it's not surprising that photography might become one's hobby. This came to pass with diagnostic and interventional radiologist, Dr. John Straub. So I'm kind of jumping ahead. And when John was about to retire, he decided to tackle challenges of digital photography by taking several courses taught by our one and only Frank Zaremba. Yay. Yay. Nice. And then he met with John Kokinas. John, you're in there too. And those classes who suggested he might enjoy attending Simsbury Camera Club with the goal of extending this skill set. Charmed by Judy Rabinowitz, and exposure to the late Nathan Gutman's practical wisdom, John became an enthusiastic SCC member. His first involvement in the club's political hierarchy was as the club's refreshment czar, Nancy. <laughs> this unlikely stepping stone led to the club's vice presidency that was followed by a three-year term as president, followed by me. John's most recent key roles in the club include judging chair, God bless you, and liaison to the NECCC and PMA. And still, John finds a time to dazzle us with his photography, in particular, his dynamic, energetic, dramatic, and emotion-infused sports photography. John, we can't wait to find out how you did it. It's all yours, John. Well, thank you, Susan. I, uh, with Frank's permission, will share my screen now and see if I can find my presentation here and see if I can actually get the start from the first slide. Excellent. Wonderful. We're in business. Um, thank you for that uh, very elaborate introduction, Susan. And um, I appreciate uh, very much the uh, Simsbury Camera Club for teaching me a lot and being the um, spur behind um, my enthusiasm because uh, I have learned so much uh, based on this association. That takes me back uh, before I go any further to when I first joined in 2015. One of the first lectures I heard was uh, John McGarry, who's on this call today. John McGarry talking about sports photography. John taught me and others a good deal in that presentation and some of the technical things he talked me, uh, told me about, I'd heard for the first time in his lecture and I still use a lot of those today and I'll be passing those on to you as well. Um, so thank you, John, for that and for the inspiration. Looking at your images really got me enthused about pursuing this a little bit myself. Um, John is also an excellent insect photographer. And I'm sorry, John, as good a persuasive guy as you are, you will never get me to go out and track down any bugs. So uh, I would <clears throat> ask also before we get started, Please save any questions to the end. I've tried to time this thing and it may run a little long. I don't want to keep people up uh, too late. So if you would kindly uh, wait until the, um, I'm just going to kill this thing on my screen. Wait and, until uh, after the, uh, the talk to ask questions, I'll be happy to stay as long as anyone wishes to do that. So the uh, title of my uh, presentation is Sports Photography, The Quest for Dramatic Moments and Real People. 
And that highlights one thing that I found in doing sports photography, that you really can't separate sports photography from people photography. You can certainly image people and not do sports, but the other way around is very difficult. Uh, back about 400 BC, uh, Plato observed that you can learn more about a person in an hour of play than in a year of conversation. I think he was uh, hinting at the fact that when we become involved in competition, whether as a participant or whether uh, you are a fan of what's going on, that you will um, invariably have to reveal a little bit of yourself that you might not otherwise reveal in polite conversation. Many years later, some other old guy, me, uh, stated that differently, saying that competition dissolves some of that social makeup that we all have of both competitors and their fans, giving the camera brief glimpses into their souls. And uh, I think that it's a good thing that we have these uh, guardrails as it is on our personality so that we can carry on in a polite, polite society, although I think those guardrails are becoming uh, less high than they used to be based on what I see in the news every night. But um, it's good and healthy, I think, to once in a while let those uh, horses out of the corral and let them run a little bit, as long as you can get them back into the corral at the end of the competition. I started to feel a little guilty about plagiarizing Plato, even though that's sort of alliterative. I decided that I really ought to get some sort of permission and using a little known Adobe app. It's uh, Adobe Ancient is the name of it. Um, I was able to contact Plato and I told him what I was planning on doing and I asked for his permission to uh, use his observation and, uh, you know, create my own uh, interpretation. And, uh, well, as you can see from his initial response, he was uh, not terribly high on the idea. He also put in a little dig that the uh, cutout I'd done of myself was kind of sloppy. And I said, you know, I agree. Um, and then I, he said, so what's a camera? And I said, boy, that's that's complicated. I'm not sure that, that I can answer that question, but I will tell you this. I've always thought that you were way smarter than either Aristotle or Socrates. And he thought about it for a minute. And then he changed. He, he, he warmed up a little bit and he went ahead and gave me permission. <laughs> do what I've done. So there are elements common to all sports photography, and that is the efforts and the reactions of people. Life's drama uh, abound at sporting events. Why is that? Because real life is an ongoing series of competitions. From important stuff like surviving birth, learning to walk, finding food, and shelter and getting an education and a job and recovering from illness and injury to petty stuff like having cool clothes, a fancy car, the greenest lawn, or having the most megapixels on your camera. That last one isn't that petty. Um, sports are contrived competitions that are, I think, designed to mimic real life. And in so doing, they offer participants and observers the opportunity to vent that venting I was talking about, as if life and limb were really at stake. And in so doing, they also give the photographer the opportunity not only to record feats of athletic prowess, but also moments of unvarnished humanity. What I plan to discuss is the goals of sports photography as I see them, general working principles and considerations for imaging all sports, specific strategies for photographing each sport discussed, and equipment options and suggestions for each venue. The goal of the complete sports photographer, the way I see it, is to capture both competitive action, key moments of athletes striving against themselves, other athletes, gravity. It's amazing how many of our sports involve showing what we can do against gravity and the elements, and this tends to apply only to outdoor sports, um, but you will find that most of our competitions involve components of at least three and often four of these. Um, 
and also to uh, capture the emotion of both athletes and fans. Extreme expressions most evident during or just after key moments in the competition and the more quiet and contemplative humorous expressions commonly encountered before the game or also during pauses in the action. And of course, you can't forget to get post-competition agony and ecstasy images. Objectives to consider when shooting any sport are the following. Get a unique perspective. Show people something that they are unlikely to see from the stands. Try to get an angle the average spectator hasn't seen. You will find among my images many times where I am unable to achieve that objective, but it's always in the back of my mind. Shoot from a low vantage point when possible, the so-called frog's eye view. And what that does, shooting low tends to make for a very dynamic composition, which features the athlete in this case in a larger than life capacity and really leaves no doubt as to what the focus of your um, image is. And it uh, is, an, is it an angle that most times the average spectator has not seen. Um, strive for simple compositions. I think that's generally a good idea in all photography. And it's hard to do sometimes in, in athletic competitions because there, there are crowds around. But even within that, there are ways to simplify if you pay attention and plan. And look for details. Details within the more complex uh, situations sometimes arise that are quite interesting. And uh, details in equipment and things that are, or uh, things about the venue that uh, the average fan might overlook. Try to shoot clean. That is, always consider the background. An uncluttered or at least blurred background is always preferable. In general, shoot with a wide open aperture. This is in case, just uh, in case you have a cluttered background, if you shoot with a a wide open aperture, the narrow depth of field that results, particularly if you're using a long lens, will still isolate the subject from the background. Use back button autofocus and auto ISO. These are things I learned from John McGarry. The back button autofocus allows you to lock on to the subject that you're chasing, in this case, an athlete of some sort, and it will if your tracking system is good in your camera, tend to hang on to that until you're done shooting. And um, I shoot in manual mode all the time. I pick the aperture based on the depth of field that I desire. I pick, most importantly, the shutter speed according to the rapidity of the action I am shooting. And I leave the ISO to the camera. I know we've had some bird photographers recently who say they don't like auto ISO. It doesn't give them a reliable um, image. And uh, I haven't had that problem that I've noticed. And besides, I picked two things. I paid a lot of money for this damn camera. It can do some of the work. So I figure, and it usually does a pretty good job. I've been happy with auto ISO. And particularly in action, always use burst mode for all action, and God bless the delete key. My particular camera only shoots at a maximum six frames a second. I know some of you have cameras that will shoot much faster than that, but you got to think of what's going to be on that memory card when you take it home and present it to your computer and hear those microchips groan. But one of the beauties of digital photography is you can quickly get rid of a lot of those images. It's picking among them that is the challenge. Anticipate the moment and be patient. Know your sport and be ready and in position with that knowledge to anticipate where there is going to be action that you might want to shoot. And always be ready for the jubilation and devastation. General working principles favor access over star power when choosing an event. Amateur and semi-pro events are preferable to big time events. I love the Red Sox. I love seeing first class athletes perform. When it comes to taking pictures, I'm very limited if I go to Fenway Park in views that I can entertain. 
Whereas if I go to an amateur or semi-pro event where there is open seating or grounds, I have a plethora of places I can shoot from and I can use my imagination. You know, uh, semi-pro and amateur athletes are still pretty darn good athletes and you can get some awfully good action shots without them being world-class athletes. So sacrifice top-notch athlete for better access. Tips regarding social interaction and getting better photo ops. You are dealing with human beings in this place and in some of these venues fairly closely with them. I've noticed uh, that big camera access is a real thing. When you show up at a venue and you've got a big camera, sorry, cell phone shooters, but the big camera will get you access that um, because people make certain assumptions that when they see you, they think that oh, it must be working for a newspaper or a magazine and particularly amateur semi-pro athletes, they like exposure. They're not used to it. So they will give you a pass based on that. But I never lie about my situation when approached by an athlete or, or by security in some places. I, I, they ask if I work for a newspaper and I say, no, I'm a, I'm a freelancer. I'm a, associated with the Simsbury Camera Club, and believe it or not, that works. I have only rarely been told that I could not go where I really want to go. Uh, oh, hang on, I got to go backwards because I am uh, doing this. Go back to the previous image and why I want it to go previous. Okay, here we go. All right, I'm gonna, I'll catch up. Hang on, give me a second. I went way back. We'll be there soon, I promise. Buy one lecture, get one free. There you go. Um, tips regarding social interaction and getting better photo ops, Bing camera access, I've already discussed and it's a real thing use it but don't abuse it be politely aggressive when you can get access and many times i've been able to get particularly at high school games into areas near the field because of those assumptions i talked about but always be careful not to put athletes or other people around there in any jeopardy it's extremely important you can wear out your welcome really fast and just be nice, particularly in some of these venues where you are face to face with the athletes. If approached by an athlete, offer them a peek at an image or two. Um, don't be afraid to ask a question about the sport. I will, and you know, don't make it patronizing. Ask them something you really don't know, like uh, what's that that skateboard trick you just did, and they appreciate that that you don't know everything, and that you're interested really in what they're doing. You know, you have to tailor your your questions a bit. I mean, you don't want to say like, so how long has it been since you had a haircut? Or just exactly how much do you weigh? I would stay away from those questions. Those are going to be rapport killers. And offer email pictures. Um, this is a great way to engage athletes. And it's always good to remember that if you're dealing with children, to always approach a parent or a coach, never approach the children directly. I think that's a very good thing to do. I have this, this thing about pictures, about photography, and many of you have the same thing. This is not original to me, but there's a circle that's involved when you take a photograph. You see an image, you capture the image, you process it, you like the image. If that sits on my computer and nobody else ever sees it, that circle remains incomplete. If I can share that with my friends at the at the uh, camera club, or if I can share that particularly with people in the photo, then that completes the circle. And if, and you shouldn't expect this, I'd say less than half the time do I get an email back thanking me, but sometimes you get really good emails, which I, Emails, which I consider uh, frosting on the circle. Actually, I'm mixing metaphors there, but remember that frosting on the circle. It's worth working for. And remember that not everybody wants to be photographed. I have been approached by 
the the man at the um, at the skate park and asking me not to uh, take any photographs of him. And I said, absolutely no problem at all. And I don't know what his reasons are. He may be that he feels awkward about his abilities. It may be that he's in the witness protection program. Maybe it's a religious reason, although I don't know there are any many Amish skateboarders. But regardless of what the reason is, it's none of my business. If they don't want to be photographed. I absolutely respect that. General working principles to plan ahead, travel time, weather, walking distance, venue map, parking, bathrooms, event schedule are all so important. And I have failed to take each and every one of those into, into consideration in going to a shoot and have paid the price to some degree in all cases. Based on what you learn, bring water, a snack or sunscreen, depending on the venue and the weather. And know your sport. God bless the internet, because there are a lot of sports I don't know anything about. And there are so many sports out there to shoot. Um, the internet's a great resource for suggestions and optimal positioning, moments to anticipate, equipment for the best that's best for that sport and in this venue. And arrive early. Give yourself time to scout out the best locations for certain types of shots based on what you've learned and to consider lighting challenges and advantages to, so you can take advantage of them. And be ready to shoot while you're scouting because some really good stuff happens before the competition many times. Don't ignore the pre-competition warm-ups for one thing. It's pretty amazing what some of these athletes do to their body to get ready for competition. Pre-game is prime time for player fan and player player interaction and those can be great photos which I enjoy taking. The sports to be discussed are baseball. I have three different types of baseball I'll be discussing as that happens to be a personal favorite of mine as sports go. Rugby, a sport that's new to me, but is fantastic in terms of photo ops. Uh, skateboarding, something I happened on to a couple of years ago while going out to try and shoot birds in Farmington. And it's been a favorite to once in a while a uh, trip for me uh, still to this day. And cyclocross, uh, this is a national competition that has taken place in Hartford in 2017 and in 2022 and may well return. I'll explain that. It's, uh, it's a fascinating and very interesting competition to photograph. Ski jumping, I had never considered doing ski jumping and uh, Bill Laternus sent me on to this uh, tournament uh, up in uh, Salisbury every uh, February, so I'll talk about that. And then last but not least, a uh, very short discussion of the Penguin Plunge, which is a sort of sport with great moments for the photographer, uh, the athletes involved. Most of them are not truly athletes, but they are all well-intentioned people, and the before and afters are striking. First, baseball, player skill ranking, major league, minor league, college, that's Futures Collegiate Baseball League, Pete Coquinas Baseball League is high school, and then Little League. Photo ops ranking, Futures Collegiate Baseball League is has been the best for me. Pete Coquinas Baseball League that I've had one encounter with. Uh, that's why the asterisks, I got special access for that one. Little League is the best in terms of genuine homegrown emotion. Minor League and Major League Baseball, I love. The Yard Goats are very good uh, teams. They sell out a lot. But again, you're in a fixed seat position unless, and this occurs on April 12th, the camera bar every year has a little outing that they sponsored that involves an hour lecture and then uh, going down to this special area they here have near the visitors dugout to image uh, during the game and you're allowed to go out on the field before the game so it's it's a lot of fun and i would encourage people to do it if you've got a hundred bucks laying around that you haven't um, don't know what to do with i think uh, that's a good way to spend it and then uh, Major League Baseball, as I said, I love Major League Baseball, but unless you pay huge bucks to get a super grade seat, you're not going to get 
great images there and uh, major league stadiums have become much more restrictive on what types of camera equipment you can bring in. You couldn't see it flashed on there just for a second because I had very handy with this mouse, but it said access, access, access. That's the most important thing to consider. Baseball photography, equipment preferences, suggested lenses. I, I, I took a workshop at the last NEC that ran a couple of years ago with Billy Weiss, who was the chief photographer for the Red Sox. And I asked him if he only had one lens to go and image baseball with, what would he choose? And he said he would do a 70 to 200 zoom because for the number of things that he shoots, that would give him the most opportunities. Luckily, I happen to have a 70 200. I happen to use it with a strap called a black rapid strap. Some of you may be familiar with it. Basically, it allows you to keep the camera at your side out of your way and then to quickly draw it into shooting position when you encounter something you want to shoot. So with my one camera, that's what I take. If you have the opportunity to carry an extra lens or if you are lucky enough to have a second camera body, then you can use a, I would suggest using that to hold a 24 to 70 zoom lens because uh, that is a great uh, option in a lot of situations as you'll see in some of my pictures. Um, the, uh, I think Black Rapid makes a, a holster device that also uh, enables you to carry a second camera. I know a couple of people in the in the club have shown me their uh, cotton, cotton carrier, which seems to be a great alternative, which will allow you to carry a couple of cameras, uh, perhaps more comfortably than what the Black Rapid uh, alternative is. And I also use long lenses on occasion. You have to realize you are going to be somewhat restricted, but it's nice to challenge yourself once in a while. And in some places, they really are preferable to the shorter focal lengths. And I'll talk about that. Suggested settings for action, burst mode, six a second, and at least uh, a shutter speed of one to one thousand second. And I like to shoot, as I said, wide open occasionally uh, with a more narrow uh, aperture just to get a little more depth of field depending on the lens and the situation. And again, back button autofocus and auto ISO. For panning, which you can do in baseball because of the way the game is played, again, shoot in burst mode. And I use generally 1 60th of a second, and I use a little wider, a little narrower aperture for a little more depth of field because as you move with the target, the motion of the camera will blur the background and you're hoping to catch your target in focus. And I used to just shoot one shot in that, but I thought after a while, wait a minute, if I'm only using 1 60th of a second, I can use six a second burst mode quite easily and get six options rather than one. So uh, learn from my uh, stupidity there. <clears throat> Um, oh, and if you're going to use the Black Rapid, hook it up to the uh, tripod foot of the lens and not to the camera because the weight of the lens can cause problems, I'm told, with the connection to the uh, camera body. Uh, now, finally, we're to a venue. The New Britain Bees play in the Futures Collegiate Baseball League, and there are eight teams in this league, and they're all in southern New England. They compete in... From, late, or from June through early August. And these are skilled college players from schools all over the country. Most of them are from New England, but uh, there are players literally from California and really all over the country. The beauty of this place is admission is $9. That's what it was last year. They may go up this year, I don't know. And it's open seating open seating and the parking is free. So this is a bargain. When I say open seating, I mean, this is Beehive Stadium, which used to be the home of the Rock Cats before they became the Yard Goats in Hartford. <clears throat> it's a very nice venue. And you can move around and sit in any of these seats you want at any time you want. 
because they don't belong to anybody but the person sitting in them. Now, admittedly, this is during a game, but it's a school night, and this is a more sparse crowd than what you usually see. But I've never had trouble getting into position to get a picture I want. The pregame player-fan interactions are always great. Kids are always hovering down near the dugouts, and I'm a big fan of body language. This is a big moment for this little guy. I was this little guy at one time. And he's trying to remain nonchalant, but you notice that he is balancing himself with his arm on the rail behind his back, which can't be all that comfortable. These two brothers, I assessed, were also trying to appear nonchalant in talking to this player from the Brockton Rocks. Um, the older brother is taller, so he can put his leg nonchalantly on that bar and uh, lean over and talk as though this is just an average day for him. His brother is shorter and has a little tougher time getting his leg up on that bar. And that <laughs> this bar is jammed up into his armpit. But my God, he is persistent. By the way, the day the Brockton Rocks came, they had four sons of major league players, two of them Hall of Famers. And uh, that was unbeknownst to me until I got there. I believe this is either Gary Sheffield Jr. or it is Pedro Martinez Jr. Um, that may not be their actual name, but I'll call him Jr. because I don't know their real names. Anyhow, the little guy persisted, and my God, this picture that he got with, uh, we'll call him Pedro Martinez Jr., <clears throat> that his mom took with a cell phone, he will treasure for his life. And it doesn't matter to him that there are two iron bars between him and his hero. He had a picture with him. And this guy was great with kids. And a lot of the players are great with kids. This is a big deal for them, too. They're not used to being idolized. And they enjoy this. And they enjoy interacting kids because they were in that position just a few years ago. Again, uh, the New Britain Bees bring people on to the field at times that are special guests. This little girl was a special guest of the first game of theirs I went to, and the players were great with her. They met with her. It almost seemed like she knew them from maybe visiting previously. Anyhow, at the end of this session, I found her parents and Ava, that was her name, in the stands and told them I thought I might have a couple of pictures that uh, of the events that they might enjoy. And, and the mother gave me uh, the, her email address. By the way, the way I do this is I bring up my phone, I create a compose page, I hand it to the person and I ask them to type in their email address in the person who is to get the email. And then I save that as a, um, <clears throat> as a, uh, I'm blocking on the name, but you know, ones you haven't sent yet. Anyhow, uh, that's uh, that's where I save it on my phone. And then when I process the pictures, I send them out. And as I said, many times you don't hear anything, but once in a while you get these great emails back. This mother said, thank you so much for the beautiful pictures. Ava had a great time last night. Thank you for capturing the moments and sending them to us. That, my friend, is frosting on the wheel. Pre-game player fan interactions also involve teams. Usually championship teams get to go on the field with the players beforehand and run around. And then they get their picture taken with the uh, team. And I want you to notice that this little girl in the middle of this softball team is carrying the trophy, which I assume was what they won in winning their championship. Immediately after these pictures, this guy, the uh, the boss, asked if one of them could help him retrieve the uh, paraphernalia from stretching down the uh, left field line. And this little girl with the trophy immediately bolted down there to take care of that. And when she came back, she had not bothered to pass off the trophy to one of her teammates. She was going to guard that. She figured she was the safest with all this equipment. So that's youthful enthusiasm. I talked to their coach and sent them pictures, which he appreciated. The uh, pregame player interactions on this game involved a little league team from Madison. They all got to run out to their positions with the player that 
played their position. This is a huge deal for a kid. I would have killed to do this at some point. And it's a big deal, as I said, for these players, because they are used to being these kids, to be able to be the guy to tell kids how to grip a fastball or a curveball. That's a big deal for both parties concerned. And these are these kids are young, despite I'm sure this is at least a week's worth of growth here. But despite the unshaven look designed to make them look older, these are kids. This guy is undoubtedly lying about what a big man on campus he is back at his college. And uh, this guy has, you know, the rough and gruff look, and the, but he's he's on a lollipop. Come on. He's a kid. These guys are at attention in the national anthem, but the kid still sneaks out. There's some double bubble going. And these guys stretch incredibly. I could never in my best days stretch like this. And they're only too willing when you have a camera to show you what they can do. And if they happen to notice, I think, and maybe this is not fair, but I think they happen to notice that the camera guy is bald. They may pawn him by showing off their hair. I actually don't think that's what happened here. This guy um, had done this before. I saw him and I was hoping he would do it again. And I fought him because he has to put his hat on after he's done batting. And you got to get those dreads under the hat. So simple as that. And they also love to show off. They're teenagers. Look what I can do. Well, this one didn't work out, but I admire him for trying to show. This is a father and son sharing a catch right behind home plate. This is a father and son sharing ketchup right behind home plate. They chose to stop here to put condiments on their hot dogs on the top of this closed uh, trash barrel. An interesting choice. After putting this slide together, I had, I questioned whether, you know, in another 50 years, this father and son might be at this same trash barrel doing the same thing, you know, this Father-son bonding in baseball is a real thing. And um, if you don't believe it, go watch Field of Dreams. Game action behind home plate. Finally, I'm getting in some action shots. Now, these are, uh, again, uh, back button autofocusing through the netting. Once you're focused, the netting is not going to give you a problem as long as you're fairly close to it. And uh, you can shoot in burst mode, and here are two images of this <clears throat> pitcher's delivery. You notice the batter and the umpire are a bit out of focus because of where I focused. And then I can focus on the batter, and don't you know it, on the first pitch where I focused on the batter, he catches that first uh, pitch with Goodwood and drives it over the left center field wall. I kind of wish I had a look at the pitcher's face because I'll bet it's an oh my god look he's got on his face. And then he uh, circled the base and his home run trot did take a while. He's a bit of a hot dog. This happens to be Manny Ramirez Jr. that I do know for sure. And the Rocks had brought a film crew with them because of the celebrity status of some of their players. So here's a video guy taking uh, pictures as he goes through his trot. When he gets to home plate, he taunts the visiting dugout with his helmet. And as you can see, the bees catcher has a somewhat less than pleased look on his face. If I can read his mind, he's saying, better hang on to that helmet, pal. You may need it. You're next at bat. But that did not stop Manny from going on and enjoying his uh, victory and sharing it with his manager and his teammates. I can't help to think but that somewhere there's a video of Manny Ramirez Jr. celebrating his home run and cluttering the background, um, killing its simplification as some old guy with a camera shooting the other direction. Game action. From the first baseline, you can get a good look at second base. Um, not a profile look, but you still can get an interesting look at some good action. By the way, keep in mind this... Uh, advertisement on the outfield wall. This comes into play a little later. Um, and you get a good look at third base. I notice that at this level of baseball, catchers are not very good at throwing to bases and they usually miss. Here's the ball here going by. This is D'Angelo Ortiz, David's son. And I also find that 
base stealers tend to underestimate the distance it is to the base and they start to slide too early and they end up eating a lot of turf. Well, in the second place, it's interesting to note that both D'Angelo and the base runner have their eyes closed. The umpire being an umpire hopefully has his eyes open to know that this guy is safe, and uh, but he's an umpire, so they're frequently accused of not having their eyes open. On first base, you can practice your um, panning. There is a very predictable time. You're going to have a runner going by. Once a ball is hit and the runner starts to run, it's open season to pan him, and occasionally you get uh, exactly what you want, him in focus and everything else out of focus. At first base, you'll also get some interesting looks at the uh, juxtaposition of uh, umpire and player. They almost appear to be dancing here. And you'll also get some interesting lighting on more classic baseball appearances, this side lighting on this batter finishing his swing. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm going to drink just a little bit of water here. I've been talking a lot today, which isn't usual for me. Again, from the first base side at New Britain B Stadium, there are great shadows later in the afternoon. The sun's shedding, setting over uh, the left field wall, it gives these long shadows. And to image the long shadows, you need to go up a bit, breaking by rules so that you can see the length of the shadows. And down low, you're not going to be able to appreciate them. But a little further down, you can get selective pictures of players in action with their shadows, sort of a Peter Pan thing, you know, Peter wanted Wendy to show it, sew his shadow on so that this type of separation on the left didn't happen. And this guy, I'm not sure if he was exercising or if he was blessing the field, but either way, he's got a great shadow. This is the one time I brought my 500 millimeter fixed focal length lens. And I had to go really way up again, high in the um, stadium to get pictures. And I was just about to go home when this guy got on first base. And one of the things you wanna think to anticipate is when somebody's going to try and steal. And indeed, I put my took my camera again out of my camera bag and started to shoot when this guy took off. And sure enough, the catcher came through and missed with the throw. And the shortstop is kind of caught in no man's land and has to leap to avoid the uh, base runner and giving me this uh, great uh, shot of extreme effort. And then when he gets to third base, I mean, to second base, he... Uh, Rises like the phoenix in the backlit third and gave me another great image uh, backlit by that sun. From the third base side, you get a, the best look for right-handed pictures. It's just the opposite for left-handed pictures. First base side is better. And you get a look at the third baseman as well. You also, if it's an active game, will get a lot of chances to shoot guys rounding the base. And... This is another case where anticipation of a base runner is good if you are set up. And I never start to image before they're about halfway down the baseline because the buffer will run out in my camera if I start too early. But I start to shoot and you can follow through on all this right to getting to the base. And the jubilation at the end. I used to be really proud of this image because it showed five backlit high fives congratulating this guy on his home run. And then Karen Lassard came up with this, one of the best I've ever seen jubilation images. This is fantastic celebration of a home run. And she allowed me to put this in my presentation. Thank you, Karen. If you count, there are seven guys who are in the air during this uh, congratulations. And if Mr. Red Shoes here were just a little more able to jump, we would have had eight up. I would love to have a a t-shirt with just this guy on it. It would be it would be great. I'm sure he would love it. 
Pete Kokinas Baseball League. Okay, this is Pete Kokinas. Pete is the younger brother of John Kokinas. John is a longtime Simsbury Camera Club member. Many of you haven't had the uh, opportunity to meet John, who's a great guy, because he has, uh, for various reasons, had to stay away from the in-person <clears throat> meetings that we have in Eno Hall. But he still participates, and he's on this call tonight. Anyhow, Pete used to be the baseball coach at um, Buckley High School, and during that time, while he was coach, he also took on took on running this league uh, in 1975. The league itself, initiated by the Hartford Kern and some others, has been around since uh, 1946. Since I also was established in 1946, I find that somewhat karma of the sorts. Anyhow, uh, there. this is a league for teenagers for the summer, ages 13 to 19. And Pete has run this since 1975. The league's under 16 and under 19 championships games were played July 30th, 2023 at Beehive Field. And I got a call out of the blue from a number I didn't recognize, which I usually wouldn't answer, but I answered, and it's Pete. Who I'd never talked to before, but I knew instantly who he was from talking to his brother. And he asked me if I would mind uh, taking pictures during these championship games. He said he would give me full access on the field before, after, whatever I wanted within, obviously, the, uh, the uh, rules and safety precautions. And he said he would pay me. I said, pay me? If you're going to give me that sign of access, I should be paying you. I absolutely won't take any money, and I'll be there. About five days later, I dropped my damn camera and had to send it in for repairs. But I rented another D780 and was there to do this, and I'm so glad I did. Access allows unusual perspectives. Getting on the field, you can image the introductions. The first game was between Newington and Walcott, and you get just a different look from the on-field perspective. This is sort of harsh light, but as I said before, you have to deal with the light. You're given an unusual perspective to see the national anthem from the field and see all participants participating in saluting the flag. And on access field, uh, pregame also, this is for the uh, second game between Rocky Hill and New Britain. Um, you don't often see players fist bump an umpire to start with. I thought this was a nice touch and this New Britain player is doing that right now with this umpire. And the uh, national anthem for this game also, <clears throat> Also, um, from uh, on the field gives a different perspective of uh, the uh, respect that the uh, New Britain players are showing along with the umpires in this particular shot. This isn't a particularly great shot, but it's a life landmark for me in all my years of participating as a baseball player in my youth. And as a fan, I have never, ever had an umpire smile at me. And here there are three of them smiling at me and to boot for just a fleeting moment i thought this guy was signing to me that he loved me it turns out he's just saying there are two outs you actually have the have the thumb out to do the i love you sign but i appreciate the gesture anyhow uh, this is from on the field and unusual access gives you different perspectives this is the rocky hill team taking the field. At this point, I wished that I was as tall as Eric Wolf because I would have gotten a much better view, more of a bird's eye view. This is more of a baby giraffe view, maybe. Anyhow, uh, it's still interesting and one I could not have gotten. Incidentally, because I could change lenses down in the uh, area between the dugout and the clubhouse, I was able to use my 24 millimeter lens to get this shot. And 
the low level gives you the more of a perspective that is again closer to a frog's eye, but still not frog's eye. This is more of maybe a cocker spaniel view. Um, you know, I thought of at times on this summer afternoon lying down on the field so that I could get a a lower angle, but then I had second thoughts. Being next to Pete, the oldest guy in the stadium, if people who haven't been paying attention all of a sudden see an old guy laying on the ground on a hot day, it could be an EMT moment that we might all regret. So I did not choose to do that. Also with this access, I was able to get some pictures. <laughs> this of the trophy, they bring the trophy with stickums gold stickums with the name of each team on it so they can put the winner on just before presentation. And you get a much closer, more intimate look at the players. This from a, a folding chair next to the third base dugout. <clears throat> and again, uh, there's these are views that are a little different than what the average fan in the stands can see. We very much appreciated the New Britain players leaving a space there so that the chef on the outfield wall could uh, show that he was enjoying the game as well. Uh, this was from my, uh, in the first game where the light was a bit more harsh, trying to get uh, an image of a play at third base. And I did get one shot of the um, cleats and the glove and the bag. But as you can see, the third base coach has chosen to stand in an area where it was not advantageous for me to get any other good images. And then I remembered that that uh, apparel sign with the guy sliding on the left center field wall. So I was just in the chair much further down so that that was in the background. And I waited. And sure enough, a Newington player tried to steal third base once again, the the catcher cooperated and threw the ball away. But, and once again, the base stealer underestimated the distance to the bag and did a belly flop a good distance from the bag, not mimicking the guy on the outfield glass quite, but the next image he puts his head up, puts his feet up, and it's not nearly as elegant as the appearance of this New Britain B player but I appreciated the effort once again. Being inside the dugout, I could get, uh, again, a perspective that folks in the stands can't get. And being in the dugout, I could get a feel for the chatter that goes on there and the critique of the umpiring that invariably takes place both in the dugout and on the field. Um, Umpires never seem to realize that you were not out. After the game, which Newington won, I love these uh, uh, shake hand lines. I think they should extend them into uh, higher up sports as well. Here's Pete presenting the trophy to the uh, Newington coach. And um, these are the Newington parents all out on the field taking picture of their sons. Um, again, I wished I was as tall as Eric Wolf. I would have gotten a much better bird's eye view of this, but uh, this is fun. I then took the obligatory picture in front of the stadium scoreboard of the entire team. I had to add this coach in in post because he wasn't there for this particular picture, but thank God for Photoshop. Anyhow, the second game was won by New Britain. They celebrated their victory differently. They took the trophy. They ran out to the area of the scoreboard, board, gathered around it, and did some chants and raised the trophy and had a good old time. And then they posed for their picture. Now, I didn't get quite the optimal positioning that uh, would have been ideal of the scoreboard, but... Uh, all the parents are now to my right, and um, turns out their uh, pictures are probably even better than mine, but it was fun. This is backlit light, so from 
I had to do a little uh, lightning in Photoshop to bring out the faces in the team players. Little League Baseball, the, the last baseball venue I do, and this is one of my favorites because the drama and emotion flow freely and genuinely at a Little League game from the expressions on the faces and the face, not only of the player, but of the teammates watching from the dugout to the tragedy of a dropped fly ball. Um, this is a big stage. These kids are thrilled to be there, but if anything goes wrong, it's at least at that moment, the biggest tragedy of their lives and they respond accordingly. The New England Regionals of the uh, baseball world, Little League Baseball World Series are held in Bristol every August. And um, it's worth attending. The pitching change often requires consolation. Again, emotions run high. And when you're taken out of a game pitching, even though you go to another position, it's frequently <laughs> considered an extreme failure. And you don't have to be an, an expert of body language to see who's coming out of this game. And here's a player taken out, feeling incredible shame, going to the outfield and being consoled by his fellow outfielder. And he got over it. They all get over it. It's a good learning position, but I admire the fact that the coaches do understand this situation. There's one situation where long lanes is really good to have because you can shoot unobstructed from the outfield wall if you're tall enough. These are with a 600 millimeter lens and I can get a very good look at the action. I can take a look, get a look at players taking the positions. This is my personal favorite because if I ever got to the point when I was playing at this age that I got to a regional final of anything I would have been golly shucks just thrilled to be there and that's kind of the look he has on his face it's a also a great chance to see the spectrum of body sizes that come in 11 and 12 year olds players uh, awkward adolescent bravado boredom and angst are all on display you can see a little bit of each in these players and this poor guy is going through the awkward phase of trying to learn how to adjust a cup if you've never worn button before. That can be a little uncomfortable if you don't get it right. Here are the tough 12-year-olds from Fairfield. This is during a rain delay. It was cloudy all day. I love the eye black. Nonetheless, part of being tough. And here, here I am again, this kid running out, my favorite uh, of the... Uh, enthusiastic players and the fans run a spectrum here's mr big shot i guarantee you that none of the players in either dugout would admit to this guy being a relative certainly not a father or uncle of theirs and their hope then is that he's not a fan of theirs to a little brother with a sign you can see how low the fence is out here so it is possible particularly in the smaller little league fields to get a good book at home plate from out here the photo ops abound even, abound even when there's a rain delay. When you put kids together with puddles, it's only a matter of time. doesn't require much anticipation before this starts to happen. Umpires pull extra duty in Little League. Everybody pitches in when there's a rain delay, putting that tarp on the field. These games are televised, so that adds to the pressure on these little kids, but they love it. Um, and you notice the ESPN cameraman is not going to help with the tarp on the field. <clears throat> Little League faces are the earliest form of effort expression, and I love them for this. These are genuine effort expression, expressions that you will see in other sports more developed later on, and I will show you those sports. These... Um, are pure and in the earliest phases. These are embryos of effort phases. Rugby. I had never shot rugby before. I'd seen John McGarry show some images of rugby matches. I knew that the 
Hartford Wanderers uh, played their games in Hartford. They've been around since 1966. They play in a league that covers all of New England. And uh, the games are all played at Colt Park. There's no admission. The parking, however, is inconvenient. Seems to me it's about a quarter mile walk from either parking lot. There are no concessions, so you should bring a snack. You should pee before you go. And despite all that, it's still so worth it. <clears throat> before I move to the next slide, <clears throat> excuse me. The um, These pictures of the rugby balls I took when I came in with my cell phone because I only had my 500 millimeter with me. Um, I took this because when I was at the University of Iowa, I had a classmate who played club rugby. I went to one of the matches. I just remember not knowing what the hell was going on. But what I remember most uh, about Kent was the bumper sticker he had on his car, which said it takes leather balls to play rugby. And that came instantly to mind when I saw this scene. I had to capture it in memory of Kent. Equipment suggestions, 400 millimeters or longer, a monopod and knee pads. You don't want to get too close to this action because it is fairly brutal. Knee pads. You have to have a little humility. You can't worry about looking like a geek because it will save your knees. And um, I use them and I use a monopod on this because maintaining position uh, with this camera in a kneeling position uh, in particular is uh, challenging. So the monopod is absolutely necessary. Uh, there is another use for knee pads. Uh, when you're doing sports um, photography, you are somewhat subject to when the matches are scheduled, so you don't always get to pick the light. So I use the knee pads also to pray for good light. This is the prayer that I personally use. Oh, God, please save us from fecoluminance. Fecoluminance is the pseudoscientific term I use for crappy light or that other slightly more vulgar S word. Uh, that we will use from time to time. And I learned that you never pray from right to left. And for those of you who may not be <laughs> photographers and may not be familiar, um, there is a uh, commonly held dictum that uh, since we read from left to right, images that show motion ideally should be displayed with left to right motion, even if it means horizontally flipping the picture. Sometimes it makes a difference. I'm not a, a com in complete agreement with that, but I am in complete agreement when it comes to praying, because if you have the audacity to pray from left to right, look at this harsh light, terrible, <clears throat> sincere as your prayer is. So you always pray from left to right and look at Look at beautiful, soft light. You can almost see the beams of celestial approval from oh. above. Now, this is the rugby pitch. I know all the lingo now. I don't know what all of it means, but this is called the pitch. It's slightly larger than a football field. One of the things I learned from the internet that this is probably best imaged from the end zones for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> there are 30 players out here, 15 on each team. When you try to shoot from the sidelines, there's an excellent chance you're not going to get a picture, plus there are players along the sidelines. In the end, particularly if the action is moving toward you, you can get some great shots, and if the player is able to separate himself from the pack, you will also get some great shots, and it's a little bit safer. Nobody's going to accidentally run over you. This is a rugby scrum. Most people are familiar with this. I would love to know how they started to do this back in the Middle Ages or whenever this sport started. It looks like organizing headbutting gridlock. It's very congressional to me, but it's kind of got a simplistic beauty to it as well. And there are details within a scrum that you can focus on. One of the things I noticed is that there is an awful lot of grabbing that goes on. That seems to be accepted because everybody's grabbing. One complete surprise was that apparently 
I know of no other sport where one guy can grab another guy's butt and it doesn't turn into a bench clearing brawl. But rugby is different. Rugby, uh, I use burst mode with back button autofocus auto ISO. When you happen to catch that player on a breakaway, you can shoot. And there are many more images of this fella as he's made his way toward the end zone. Uh, all the way to actually scoring, much to my um, happiness, although he was playing for the other team, I appreciated his effort and his photogenicity. Um, facial expressions are very sincere. These are more mature Little League faces. In case you're worried, this is not an actual missing tooth. A lot of them cleverly blacken an area of their mouth guard to look more, even more vicious than they do. The facial expressions are are weird. This guy all, always kind of looked like this. He always looked like he was about to cry. Um, these guys have well-developed Little League faces. They uh, are very much and very sincerely expressing their involvement. This guy, I kind of worried about. I think that he, uh, I'm guessing that he was in concussion protocol. And this is his trainer saying, no, Jack, no, Jack, you're, it's too early. You ought to wait another week or so. Your kid's helmet is not going to protect you, no matter how many dinosaurs it has on it. But uh, Jack stayed in the game. I'm giving him that name. I don't know his real name. And here's a picture with both Jack and the guy who's going to cry in the same image. Backgrounds do make a difference. As you can see, there's a cluttered background here. Because of the narrow depth of field, you can still separate the ball and the player well. But you can't deny that having this dark background enhances that visibility even further. Sometimes backgrounds are just funny. Remember I told you to pee before you go? Well, apparently that message didn't get passed around the bus of the Boston team. So this is during warm-ups and nature called, and I happen to find this on my images uh, after the fact, but I'm glad I did. Rugby offers scenes of varying savagery and commendable sportsmanship. As hard as these guys hit each other and, are, and brutalize each other, I never once saw any angry words. I never saw any fights break out. I never saw any flopping. I can imagine a soccer player playing this. And uh, they frequently help each other up. Your team, the other team, somebody gets hurt, they all gather around and uh, are interested. So I admire the sportsmanship of rugby players. And believe me, there is hair raising action for all involved, except maybe this guy, one of my bald brothers, taking out this guy with way too much hair. Skateboarding. One I happened, a uh, sport I happened on to one day when I was going to Tungsus Mead to take a walk and maybe look for some birds. Uh, these guys were skateboarding. It was, it was a skate park that hadn't yet opened. So I changed lenses and I went over and started to shoot. And I've become uh, a now and then visitor there because it is very fun to watch. Um, I use a wide angle lens, 24 to 70. You don't want anything longer than that because you're just too close to the action. Again, knee pads or even a small collapsible stool is handy. And you can get low here. You can get genuine frog's eye views that even Kermit would be proud of. You want to shoot at least a thousandth of a second or faster because these things occur quickly and definitely in burst mode. <clears throat> There's nothing scheduled, so you can avoid harsh light. And for that matter, boarders don't much care for the hot middle of the day either. The challenge is gaining trust. This is a venue where I will usually ask permission uh, because there are guys there just working out. And I say to you guys in mind if I take some pictures and they'll always invariably say, oh, sure, man, anytime. Yeah, cool. Yeah, you go ahead. You go ahead. I get called man a lot over here, I notice. I'm still waiting to be called pops, but uh, that hasn't occurred yet. I find the shooting, you need to find a shooting vantage point that's safe for both you and the border. 
And again, sharing images and offering email pics does help. This is Tungsten Mead Skate Park. X is where I shoot most of those elevated shots that you'll see. Y, there's a platform here that they ramp up to and do some grinding on. And Z, which is off the, uh, <clears throat> the picture here, is an embankment that you can actually lie down on, even I can lie down on, and shoot up over here as they rise over the embankment. You shoot in burst button. In burst mode with back button autofocus, this first group of images was actually made shooting it. Another area, the other way from the venue that I showed you. But once you lock on, you can get some great pictures. And usually there's a very good background. This is shooting from that embankment forward as they come up. Here's the same guy on another pass shooting from X. Looking up, again, Kermit eye view, frog eye view, nice sky to separate him out. You think he's going to land on his face for sure, but he will show you if you continue to shoot in burst mode that he's in control and indeed he landed safely. You can do back button auto-focusing and follow guys all the way from the ground right up into the air. This is one of the guys that I sent to... Uh, an email to, and I got this back from him. These are great man, man again. Thanks a lot. You're always welcome to pull up. More frosting on the circle. Anticipate as boarders tend to practice in the same, the same trick. Here's this guy trying this trick with a guy from a board shop actually shooting a video of him. Here he is practicing the same trick later on his own. I noticed that I bet he has a very similar pair of shoes at home, except the black shoe is on the right foot. Anyhow, and this I just took Monday going back there for whatever reason uh, to try out some backlit shots. I did send these to this guy. I got nothing in return. He was probably disappointed that he's not recognizable, and I can dig that. Some moments are predictable. There are guys that come there in bikes and girls, I might add. This guy got good air. And sometimes you see the unexpected, like have you ever seen a rising bicycle moon? Well, now you have. This is a rising bicycle moon. I think I would characterize this as a gibbous rising bicycle moon. And sometimes gravity wins. I don't tend to show the borders images of their crashes. Cyclocross. And uh, this won't take very long. I promise I'm getting to the end. I see I'm running a little long here, but this is worth waiting for. The last two are worth waiting for, and they will be quick. As I said previously, they've had these competitions twice in Hartford. These are national competitions. There are cyclists who do this crazy sport, come from all over the country, and they have an academic group that actually, uh, there are schools, particularly, uh, I mean, Harvard, MIT had cyclocross teams. Northwestern did. Anyhow, this is the venue. This is Riverside Park in Hartford. You park across the bridge here off Market Street in Hartford, and then you go over the pedestrian overpass. You pay, I think it was around $15 to get in over here. Once you get over here, you can go wherever you want. So access, is, this is access heaven. And <clears throat> I would suggest that you uh, use a 70 to 200 millimeter lens. It gives you the most options to shoot. Wear warm, waterproof boots, as these, at least when it's occurred here, has been an, an impossible. Go after or just or during uh, rain or snow because that greatly improves the photographic options. You can shoot from above hill climbing. A lot of the time is spent off the bike in this competition, which is sort of like steeplechase with both areas where they need to push their bike, carry their bike, uh, sand pits, water, everything. Or snow. In the snow, uh, it also affords some interesting 
observatory points. Mud, in my estimation, is the king. However, it must be navigated, and these people seem to enjoy it. Look at the mud spattering on this guy. This woman is carrying her bike down this muddy slope, thereby competing against both gravity and the elements, as well as herself and the other competitors. Mud is king and must be embraced. These people all seem to be enjoying themselves in the mud. And this guy, not so much in his defense. There's a reason for that. He's waiting to get his turn to wash off this bike. He was not a competitor. If I can read his mind, he's saying, I don't know why I ever got this damn bike for this kid. It's wrecked my life. So there are good opportunities to pan at these meetings. Once you find a straightaway, you can practice your panning and get some interesting shots. It's even worth while to shoot exhaustion, I shot this guy because I really thought there was going to be a need for CPR here pretty quickly because he was genuinely exhausted. But after a while, taking off some of his gear, he uh, relaxed a bit and he did survive and he survived to become part uh, of a uh, creative image I made on our kitchen counter using an old sneaker of mine and putting him resting. I call this all sneakered out. Last but not least of the real competitions is ski jumping. Bill Eternus told me about this. It takes place in Salisbury every February. This is Satra Hill where the competition takes place. It's already happened this year. I would suggest using a 24 to 70 millimeter lens and climbing to mid mountain to get the best pictures. If you're going to shoot from the lower down the mountain, then a 7200 may be a better choice. Again, fast shutter speed, back button autofocus, spare battery inside an inside pocket so that it stays warm in case you need it. Climb the steps to mid-mountain for the best photo ops. Warm boots with crampons. These are kind of tires for your boots. I did not wear these my first visit, and I fell on my butt twice. So the second time around, I had those on, and they were great. From the bottom of the hill, this is kind of like a county fair atmosphere. You have to bring your own seating if you want to sit. You can buy souvenir cowbells. There are vendors there selling food. <clears throat> and people come and watch up the hill. As you can see quite obviously here, they frequently bring the dog, their dogs. And this guy was where the first time, apparently he's a regular there and has done, uh, creates these big uh, bonfires where people can warm themselves if you're interested. He was not there the second time I came, and I'm not sure of the reason for that. Hopefully he's okay. For those who uh, want to shoot from mid-mountain, you have to climb with the competitors up these stairs. There is no mechanical lift for the competitors, and certainly not for the photographers. So on these steps, you will see the competitors to the left, the photographers and people who want to watch to the right. I followed this fellow up the steps and luckily he stopped to stretch a bit. And I'd like you to notice the pock marks on the seat of his uh, suit here from previous, uh, from the learning curve that's involved in landing. Um, and this is the scene from the top of from the mid mountain once i'd gotten my breath i took this photo looking upward to the area that they come down to gain speed to actually jump and the skiers would come up and practice uh, just to get warmed up going down the field below this was an attendant that brought his young daughter with him and he showed her the uh, ski jump, and I'm sure she won't forget that day soon. And these are and these are young kids um, practicing to kind of get loose. And I recommend going during practice because 
you can get just as good a shot and I'm not sure how crowded it gets during the competition up there. Places to shoot from, I'm off to the skier's left here. This guy sitting underneath is in a great place to shoot. This guy shooting up here, I don't think that's quite as ideal a place as the background is cluttered by some old guy with a camera shooting this way. From underneath, you can see this guy taking off. And you can see him going down again from the more underneath location. You can see this guy taking off. Luckily, he came back when I was on the right side, jumped again, and I was able to get this shot, which uh, did well in our interclub competitions, our intra club competition. I'm sorry. The uh, Bottom of the hill, these images are less interesting. I'm going to go through this quickly. You will see all phases of launching and landing. You will also see the occasional crash. Gravity can wins. This isn't nearly as bad as it looks. His leg has not been snapped. His foot has come out of his boot, and that's his heel. By the way, notice the uh, more pronounced pock marks in his butt from, uh, again, showing the learning curve that's involved here. He slid down here, put his boot back on, and skied down with no problem. And finally, penguin plunge, where pretense and poise go to die. In case you want to do this, go to the Special Olympics website, and they will tell you the specifics of these remaining dates where they do this. This is for a great um, <clears throat> charity the great cause Special Olympics of, of Connecticut and people and their offices frequently get together to form teams to go out and participate in this. I use a 70 to 200 millimeter lens again for this. And the purpose of showing you this is to show the poise and, um, um, and you know, determination that they're showing at the outset here, doing the right thing, participating in this community event. And then after they arise from the water, you see slightly different expressions. So what the hell? Whose idea was this? I think are things that come to mind when I see this picture. This young girl, for the first time, participating in helping out in her community. This is that same girl. As she arises from the water saying, what the? Well, she's not allowed to talk that way, but I'm sure she thought that. Um, this guy appeared to have delusions of grandeur and that he wanted to do, uh, to be, uh, felt himself a superhero. He, after emerging from the water, appeared to be rethinking his superpowers. And these two women, who I don't have a before on, clearly show a determined after. These women asked if they were going to participate again next year. They said, hell no. So in summary, finally, complete with a dopey acronym, Johnny's Keys to Enjoying Sports Photography. And you can enjoy sports photography even if you're not particularly successful at it. One is access, favor access over everything else. Planning. Be prepared. It will save you a lot of misery and get you some good images. Anticipate. Learn your sport and anticipate where the action will shoot fast and shoot low when possible. And share your work. Complete that circle and maybe get a circle with frosting on it. But wait, there's more. Not much more, but a little more. So many sports, so little time. There are so many sports I haven't covered, and I'm not even going to picture here. Powder puff, football, golf, um, whatever the hell you call this, which I can't remember at the moment. Anyhow, craziness. Craziness over the Pacific. Surfing, another kind of craziness. Uh, super craziness. Uh, doing bike trips, tricks um, in front of a crowd playing polo, windsurfing. It's my son-in-law who's a good windsurfer. The dog walking. Oh, okay, maybe not dog walking, but also so many 
sports so little time. This is also a people photographer's paradise. You can go from cute to cuter to pensive to bored or lonely or both to obnoxious to scary. I entitled this picture, Vito, go break that guy's camera. That didn't happen, but I, I think I was reading his mind. That's what he was thinking. And then finally, to bring up the rear, there's old cute. Being old myself and never wishing to be referred to as cute, uh, I chose this couple to bring up the rear. And with that, I will end my presentation. And I will, if possible, uh, I can't seem to unshare my screen here. But while I'm trying to do this, oh, there we go. Uh, stop your share, which I did. Okay. Hey, John, right. I have a question. Yes. So I'm assuming that when you're shooting these sports, you're using continuous autofocus. Yes. Um, are you are you using tracking ever or just the I continuous do. autofocus? Um, and it varies. Most of the time I use single spot tracking. And okay. you're right. I should have mentioned that when I talk about back button autofocusing for shooting mm -hmm. action. Yes, you have to keep your thumb on that back button autofocus button and uh, uh, that most of the time will stay locked on to your subject and uh, it gives you a lot of pictures to uh, to pick from in the end and just sorting through them is kind of the drudgery of this at the end yeah and the, the thing i was kind of interested in is the when you're at the baseball game and other places like this where there's a net up and you said, oh, I can, if I get the focus on the player, then I don't really have to worry about the net. But if you, I feel like if you move the camera a little or something happens, then it's going to switch over. Well, that's true if you're not using back button autofocus. But if you keep your finger on that button, if and I you keep on the focus button. on that thing, okay. it will ignore the netting. If you're not using back button autofocus, that's a, a very real possible hazard. In general, about the netting, if you can stay close to the netting, it's less of a yes. problem. You can still yep. see a little difference. But the further away you are, the more you can see it in the background of your images. At the Little League Park, they don't have netting. They have chain link fence. It's heavier gauge, and it's hard to avoid having that in your images, even when you're close. That was why getting out to the outfield, uh, you don't have to deal with that if you have a long lens. That will give you some good shots unobstructed by that. But, you know, some shots, I don't care if there's netting in the way the uh, the impact of the image is still there if you got the right moment and expression. So just keep your finger on the back button focused the whole finger time. Don't take it off. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. You are welcome. John, John yes. I have, one yeah. I have one problem with back button focus. I don't know if it's my coordination or the fact that I wear eyeglasses, I just had trouble dealing with the problem with my eyeglasses and the back button focus. So am I holding the camera wrong? Um, I doubt that you're holding the camera wrong. I also wear glasses and um, on occasion, and you probably have this option on your camera as well, if you're shooting through the viewfinder, if you can, <clears throat> You can take your glasses off and you can dial diopters into the uh, the viewfinder mm -hmm. that will allow you to focus. However, when you go away from the viewfinder and try and look at what you've got, everything is blurry. So that's the downside of that. But you might try that if you're having trouble um, in keeping that focus on. It also could be that uh, the focus mode that you're in, you can use one detector, you can do multiple detectors. And also you can vary within the camera menu how long you want the camera to avoid, uh, to keep your focus and ignore 
intervening things like other players coming in the way, you can set that to a setting. I know in the Nikon menus, there's a setting there where you can change the uh, veracity with which that uh, uh, cam the camera will hold that focus on what you're trying to focus on and not jump to something else as you go by. So maybe looking into your menu and adjusting that to a longer time to hold focus, that might be helpful too. Thank you. Yep. So uh, John, Bob Ferranti. Hey, Bob. Um, hey, John. So I haven't been out in any kind of sports venue in since pre-pandemic, and I don't know what uh, you know what's allowed in terms of carrying a bag, a backpack. Uh, you know what's what's allowed these days, and and do they have inspections when you go in? Uh, certainly not at the uh, New Britain Bees. Uh, I don't recall any inspections at Little League. Um, that there is, they are a little more guarded there because they have kids playing there and there's always mm -hmm. those weird potentials um certainly there's <laughs> no restrictions to uh bringing anything to the rugby matches how those guys bring their own beers so there's uh, there's nothing there and nobody will inspect or bother with what you're bringing uh and, but certainly for the bees no problem they do go through your bag at fenway park uh, they do go through your bag at Duncan Park, although I uh, and I'm, I'm not sure what their regulations are in terming in terms of bringing length of lenses. I know in major league parks and a lot of minor league parks they limit your um, uh, the length of the lane lens that you'll bring in for some reason. That uh, I'm sure they have reasons for that. That's probably a you know, safety they, thing. If you if you a, have a long lens and you turn your whack. Yeah, it, it could seat. be that, but I used to be able to get into those same venues with that long lens. I think it has more a security thing in mind uh, because of, you know, all the uh, crazies out there. that would be loaded with TNT or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, my camera is definitely not deadly, but uh, <laughs> I understand their concerns. I, I can tell you with the uh, with an NFL stadium, you can't take in a bag, and there is a limit for uh, for a lens. Maybe it was two hundred millimeter. I can't remember what, but uh, for uh, I don't know if all women's college, if all women, if all WNBA is like this, but where the Seattle Storm plays, and I took pictures at uh, Sue Bird's last home game. Mm -hmm. The rule there is worse. You cannot have uh, at that uh, uh, for that team, the storm. You cannot have a detachable lens. Exactly. So I had to go with a uh, pocket camera. Yeah, I ran into that at Petco Park out in San Diego, which you know kills taking any of this equipment in. Last time I was at Fenway, I was able to bring my camera in, and. Yeah, I think I could still bring my 70 to 200 in, but I think looking at their website that they've they've got stricter rules now. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to check with the particular venue ahead of time. And most of the time, you'll be able to find that that information online. For UConn at the Thanks, Civic yeah. Center, I couldn't find any specifics. So I just I just I, uh, I just took the pocket camera anyways. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. OK. Any other uh, questions? That was wonderful, John. Thank you so very much. Yeah, yeah thanks, John. On the circle. Hey, thank hey you. John. Just thank you, thank John. I, I appreciate that. Um, it was fun to put together and to deliver. And uh, I'll have laryngitis for a few days, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm better when I'm quiet. So. <laughs> Hey, hey, John, just one, just one point. This is Mike Sperber. Just, you know, first yeah. off, great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one thing I want to add with respect to baseball, if anybody's out on the Cape over the summer, the Cape Cod League is a phenomenal way to, you know, to go out and take pictures. It's all of their games are played. Um, they're, they're college kids who are, who are shooting for, you know, pro contracts. Um, every game is, is, highly covered by scouts for some of the pro teams um the the players are extremely accessible 
um, even more so than I think at the at the bees because there there's no gate, there's no um, fence between the players and the field or the field and and the spectators, and um, they're all played at like elementary schools. Uh, yeah, I, that's that's great. That's a great thing to bring up because I I think the talent is better there, and it sounds like the access to good shooting positions might be even better than at the B stadium. So man, now yeah. you make me want to travel out to the Cape, but traveling to the Cape in the summer is such drudgery. Yeah. yeah. If you're there, you gotta go, you gotta yeah. go catch a game, you know, catch a game. You, I mean, literally you can stand right next to the dugout and, and take pictures from, oh, from that's cool. it's really easy. That's how well, John is John is an the also old person. They use wooden bats there too. So you probably would like that. Yes. Yeah. Wooden bats are good. Different game, yeah. yeah. Well, that's they use wooden bats, I believe, in the bees games. Yeah, I think the New Britain yeah, the... use wooden bats. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think I think the uh, the Futures Collegiate Baseball League is kind of a Cape League wannabe. Um, yeah, I hope it survives because um, it's a lot of fun and uh, it's a lot of fun for the kids too. And I can take my grandson there, and he doesn't even like baseball, and now he does because he could go get close to players. So. There's a big, um, it, it's it's nice to have, and it's a good cheap venue for those of guys who are, um, shall we say, more thrifty. So. Here's something I took pictures of locally. There is a Connecticut Baseball Club of Hartford, spelled two words, B-A-S-E-B-A-L-L. -L. It's historical. They wear old uniforms, and that's a, and one time somebody dressed up as Mark Twain, uh, and that that was a fun thing to do, and uh, it's also fun to make your pictures black and white. The website is C T V as in Victor, C T V as in Victor, B B A dot org, and then you'll see the active clubs. Oh, that's great! That's good. do they? Where do they play? They play, uh, I don't, I went only once. They play in the southern part of Hartford. And um, they may have been at Cold Park as well. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I think they've played at Cove Park <clears throat> in Weathersfield. Cool. Thank you. That's that's a good tip, Bill. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome, Bill. Anybody else? You know the UConn game started ten minutes ago against. Well, no, it didn't. It didn't actually. I just turned it on. It didn't actually start yet because oh, probably the game it? before it was. Yeah, they always wait for the other games at time before. Well, so no, I think they were waiting. Till my, Smith. Oh, yeah. I yeah. think they were waiting till my talk was done. I think they probably are. <laughs> <laughs> I think they just. Oh, oh, you know what? They just scrolled at the bottom of the screen. John Straub talk almost yeah, over. That's it. That's it. <laughs> they, they wouldn't dare they send me to ESPN no. too. I mean, or whatever. <laughs> One of those lesser stations. All right. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Appreciate it.